seated. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll begin in this uh, particular section. Uh, I found it interesting, the songs we sang. Uh, my plan was originally to be in the book of Genesis uh, and study in chapter 12 and 13 how, uh, what happens when a crisis comes and how do we respond to that. And it's very easy for us to say, oh, I, I just trust the Lord. Well, Abraham decided uh, it would be better for him to go to Egypt. And uh, he got himself into quite a bit of a mess down there. And, uh, you know, often we find, I think, very similar things when it comes to the matter of, of giving and tithing. Uh, how do we respond in a matter of crisis? Well, we just don't tithe that week. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we, we end up coming up with our own solutions sometimes. And so uh, I want to finish this section uh, tonight, and I, I, to, unless the Lord redirects, I believe we'll be concluding this particular series uh, with this message tonight. And we put the focus on uh, giving and specifically on tithing, but I think it goes beyond that. I uh, haven't really mentioned this a lot. Tithing, we would say, is the, the basic, the minimum of 10%. Offerings uh, are the additional beyond that. And uh, I think that that certainly is very fitting. You find that uh, throughout the Old Testament as well, where there are both tithes and offerings that are given. And when we use those terms, uh, that's what we're speaking of. Some of my comments have been, in fact, much of my comments have been directed towards tithing specifically. Uh, that's not to minimize the importance of offering and so forth uh, and giving above and beyond. But what we're acknowledging is that this is in many ways at least the, uh, the basic sense of what we need to be uh, doing as believers. We spoke this morning on the aspect of a principle being developed, and we've already noted uh, that tithing must be prioritized, according to Proverbs chapter number three, bring the first fruits and uh, honor the Lord with the substance of all thine increase, and what you'll discover is your barns will be filled with plenty, and your presses will burst out with new wine. We also acknowledged in uh, Malachi chapter 3 that tithing both requires and develops faith. Uh, it's not always easy to give as the Lord leads. And sometimes this goes beyond the tithing uh, to just simply contributing uh, in whatever capacity that the Lord may lead. And then we also observed and began this point, all, got, all giving, uh, including tithing, must be motivated properly. And when we describe a motivation, what we're saying is this is the underlying factor that governs our actions. Actions. What is that? Why do we do what we do? We observed a number of uh, things as to what tithing is not to do. Tithing does not earn the disobedient Christian favor with God. Uh, this is not the means for, by which we can just live any way we please, slide in an offering envelope uh, half or an early portion of the service, and now that justifies everything else that we have uh, done throughout the week. Uh, the children of Israel thought that they could simply bring their tithes uh, to the Lord and do their offerings just as they had always done. And God says, stop it. I don't want it. It's coming from an impure heart, Isaiah chapter number one. Tithing, secondly, is not to be motivated by a selfish desire to gain more. There are some who seem to look at tithing as little more than uh, some sort of a mutual fund in which they're going to get a return on investment. Uh, that's not the motive as to why we are to tithe. Number three, tithing is not to be done to merely fulfill an obligation. We'll see a passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that will talk about uh, not giving in a grudging manner or out of necessity. I give because I have to. Uh, that's not the motivation uh, behind anything that we are to be doing. Number four, we acknowledge tithing is not to simply acquire a tax break. That is not to say that we do not take advantage of uh, the tax breaks that are there, but that is not to be uh, the primary motivation behind it. Number five, tithing is not limited or based upon perceived need. This was the final point that we left off with. Uh, if we say, well, you know, the, why do I give? Well, the church needs the money. Well, I'm not going to acknowledge or deny the fact the church uh, needs all the money it can get. And if you see fit to say, well, you know what? The church needs a million dollars and I'm going to go ahead and give it. That's fine by me. But let me say this, that it is not to be governed by a perceived need. What if there is no need that you perceive? Does that mean you can stop tithing? 
No, <laughs> you still have that responsibility. And I challenge you, uh, if the Lord sees fit to allow our property to sell, the, the piece of property to sell, and we are debt free, does that mean, wow, hallelujah, I can finally keep some of this money to myself? No, it does not. And uh, we can put ourselves into a very, uh, a very bad point spiritually. If, and God, I, I believe God is in that, and I believe God is blessing, and I uh, believe you me, <laughs> no more than anybody, I look forward uh, to the potential of being out of debt uh, and staying out of debt. But in order to do so, uh, we have to remain faithful in what God has led us to do. That's what tithing is not. We might say those are the negatives. I didn't choose to break the outline down that way. What is it and, and why do we do it and what is the proper motive? Well, number six, tithing and giving proceed out of a heart that is surrendered to the Lord. We acknowledged in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 and 9 that we're dealing with a passage that speaks of a one-time offering that was given uh, to the needy saints in Jerusalem. Uh, they had encountered a, a great physical need, and Paul, on his third missionary journey, went throughout the various churches he had established and took a collection that ultimately he delivered, uh, excuse me, to the saints in Jerusalem. While he was there, he was arrested, and that began all of his various imprisonments over the next several years, a trip to Rome where he was released. We think probably even a trip as far as Spain, but eventually he ended up back in Rome a second time, and that was when he was imprisoned. Paul is collecting this offering and he is uh, writing to these individuals to do so and he acknowledges the churches up in the region of Macedonia had contributed to this offering in spite of the financial hardships that they were experiencing. Uh, they, according to verse 3, Paul says, To their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. You get the idea in verses 3 and 4 that they literally had to beg Paul to accept their offering. Uh, and that's a challenge sometimes for me because I, I have found where individuals are uh, very willing to give and I know they are faced with financial hardship. And it's like, oh man, you know, just, just it's okay, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll take care of it, we'll reimburse that. And what I have discovered, though not perfectly applied in my life, is that sometimes people just simply want to be able to have the joy of giving and they don't want to be reimbursed. And it may be a hardship, but they want to personally experience God in this regard. And as, a, as the pastor, then I have to allow that. And it's a, it's a challenging uh, balance to find. And there are those, and I'm thankful for, uh, for many of you who have uh, willingly just simply done things uh, that, that uh, were needing doing, and, and you just simply took care of it because that was what you wanted to do. Uh, be careful with that. We don't want to just go tear down the gym because that was what you wanted to do. All right. I will not be quite so thankful for that. All right. Now let's move on though, because what we find in verse number five, this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. I have in the notes, second Corinthians eight, verse seven, it should be second Corinthians eight, verse five. That was the verse uh, that I just read. These individuals contributed to this cause, but it came out of a heart that was already surrendered to the Lord. Giving naturally proceeds out of that type of a heart. It's why this topic of conversation has come up in this series, what does a surrendered life look like? This is one of the ways in which it is going to evidence itself. It is going to evidence itself in this aspect of giving. I believe this includes tithes as well as offerings. Offerings, as I've already mentioned, would go on and would exceed the 10% tithe. But I also think that it goes beyond just simply money. What about your time? What about your talents? What about your resources? Everything that you have, as we'll see in a little bit, has been given to you by God. It all belongs to him. You are simply a manager of what God has given you. So let me suggest that you use your vehicle in a way that honors God. 
Use your time in a way that honors God. Prioritize it spiritually and accomplish what God would have you to accomplish. Take the talents that God has blessed you with. Don't simply sit on them because when you do, the entire body of Christ suffers when you do not fulfill your part in the ministry. And so you take whatever God has blessed you with and you take and you use that in a manner that is going to be very, uh, that is going to be willing to do whatever it is that God leads. Some say, well, you know what? I, I can't figure out that I'm good for anything. Be a willing servant. And I'll tell you, you'll be amazed at what God can use. Say, well, I'm not talented in this particular area. That's okay. You can do whatever God has led you to do. But do not ever forget God has taken and he has given you everything that you have. And it is all to be done for his honor and for his glory. It might be something as simple as cooking a meal to be a blessing to somebody. It might be instead of asking other people how so-and-so is doing. And by the way, with all of the sickness that we've had, God's given us a lot of opportunities to be intentionally compassionate. Take and utilize those opportunities. Send a text that says, I'm praying for you. And they may not respond. It's okay. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Here's and by the way, don't send a text, I'm praying for you, not be praying for them. Okay? Uh, I mean, you send the text. And, and, well, acknowledge, you know, hope you're feeling better. We've had plenty of illnesses and so forth. These are the things that as a church we have to get to the point of doing. Not just looking and saying, wow, well, we've got uh, the, the inside clean and the outside looks very nice. And it does. But if we do not minister to people, we have lost sight of why God has us here. Tithing and giving, it proceeds always out of a heart that is surrendered to the Lord. We can look a little bit later in verse number 9 where we consider the, what Jesus did for us. Verse 9, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Aren't you thankful? Let me show you the trans transition that happened. That ye through his poverty might be rich. Look at all God's done for you. It's not too much to ask you to step out of your comfort zone and give back to God. And it will challenge. It'll challenge you. And, and you know, I'll tell you sometimes for, for some individuals, it's easier to give 20 bucks than it is to give 20 minutes. God might want you to give 20 minutes to somebody. Money does not solve everything. And I, I am amazed. I, I sometimes even get frustrated. Uh, I know that's just very shocking. Uh, but I'm amazed at the level of technology that we have and the unwillingness of people to communicate. We communicated better when we had phones that you spun the thing around and waited 30 seconds for the dial to come all the way back around. We communicated better then, okay? We've got all of the resources and we do nothing. Is that good stewardship? We can't possibly sit here and say, well, hey, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm doing all I can. There's nothing for me to do in this ministry. You kidding me? Who's been out? Who's sick? Who's got a birthday? Minister to them. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Get a directory. Look at the board out there. Uh, it's everywhere. These things are able to be done. It's not rocket science. We've limited so much. Let's be mindful of these things. And let's take a look and see, all right, you know what? I want to do this. I want to step out of my comfort zone. And I want to get into this area. And yeah, it's uncomfortable. But if you only live in your comfort zone, you are going to live a very small uh, sphere of influence in your life if, if you're content to remain there. Someone stated that we can never live, or though we can never give like Jesus we can never be like Jesus if we do not give. It's a very accurate statement. We can never give like Jesus, but we can never be like Jesus if we do not give. Giving proceeds from a surrendered heart. Number seven, all giving is to be done cheerfully. We'll continue on in the text ahead to 2 Corinthians chapter number nine. 
And if you notice, verse number seven, the Bible teaches, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. By the way, that's an individual choice. And we're talking on an offering. We're not talking the tithe. The context of this uh, is dealing with offerings. However, the principles regarding the manner in which we give are still applicable. He is not to give grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Let me caution you just a little bit on this word cheerful. Uh, There has been some very poor exegesis of this that suggests we're to give in a hilarious manner because the Greek word uh, is hilarious. Uh, that's a bad, that's just bad Greek, okay? Uh, you don't, we don't take and just give the, take the Greek letters and give an English letter to it and, and say this is how we do that. There are good reasons for that. Uh, layman, for example, would be idiotes, okay? Uh, so we don't come along, we don't say, all right, uh, you guys are a bunch of idiotes. Okay? That's not how that works, all right? Uh, and so it, it, it's just a bad concept. It does not mean that, and I've heard some say, you're to be laughing as you're giving. No, you're really not. But let me tell you inside, you ought to be cheerful. You don't give out of obligation. It is a privilege to be able to give. And sometimes we don't see it that way. If you ever, maybe you're out for illness or whatever, you forgot a checkbook, something like that line. And you end up, praise the Lord, you've been able to contribute well to the ministry. And then you have to double up on a tithe. You ever had this happen? Some of you are looking at it. Okay, good. There's the, there's the look I'm looking for. You double up on the tithe and it's like, oof, right? <laughs> Maybe I'll just do like one and a quarter percent and I'll just kind of make this one up as, as we go on. All of a sudden, it's very easy for something that simple to, become done, to be done grudgingly and not be done cheerfully. Let's expand this to more than just money. Have you ever ministered grudgingly? Not a whole lot of fun, is it? Oh, I got to show up to the work day. Man, such a beautiful day. You got to do this. Oh, I signed up to clean the church again. Wouldn't you think someone else would finally clean the church? And then there are those who do so out of joy. It's just the way they can serve the Lord. They can sing and push a vacuum cleaner at the same time. Or perhaps, okay, if they can walk and chew gum at the same time. But, you know, we'll we'll see how all that works. My point of it is simply the attitude behind what we do and why we do what we do. There are needs everywhere, but we cannot begin to focus on doing things grudgingly, We cannot focus on doing things out of necessity. And you know, I wish I could say that I have perfected this, but I'll have to acknowledge there are times when I have gotten in extremely early on a Sunday morning or late on a Sunday morning and I might lie down and and wake up after a very brief period of time and I've told my wife, I think I'm just gonna skip Sunday school today. Okay, I'll sleep in and and I'll catch the morning service. Why? Because I'm tired. And then you stand up in the pulpit sometimes out of a feeling of obligation. And the Lord has challenged my mindset with that very much. And uh, it's a a bummer when you are preaching and being convicted at the same time, okay? You really ought to try this sometime. It's very challenging uh, to to go through that because the Lord's sitting here putting his finger on it and you're going, all right, uh, Lord, I'm sorry, but I'm still having to preach and I'm still having to think and and not just stop and say, okay, hang on, I need to repent for my attitude. Y'all just bear with me for a few minutes. Uh, It's a challenge. And sometimes we fall into those traps. We need to be very careful that we realize uh, the gift that, that we have been given in salvation. And aren't you thankful God didn't grudgingly send his son to die for us, that Jesus didn't say, man, this just isn't going to be worth it. That's not how it was viewed. Let's give with a proper attitude. We find, number eight, that giving is a means by which we show gratitude to God. I think this is one of the uh, principles, and we're not going to necessarily establish this scripturally, although it can be established scripturally. It simply is a means by which we can acknowledge, you know what, God has blessed me. And God has blessed me in abundance. There's been times where uh, I have received something unexpectedly, and that has actually been an answer to prayer for me to be able to pass on to someone else, okay? It's just because God's blessed. 
And it's like, you know, yeah, man, God's been so good to me. What, what is this for, for me to be able to have this opportunity to, to be able to do whatever it is that the Lord might be leading? It is a way by which we can, can share our gratitude to God. Let me ask you this. Has God blessed you personally? He has. Isn't it fair to say that God has blessed you in ways you can't even comprehend? What is it to give back to him? Look at all he's done for you. The offerings that the Israelites would, uh, would bring in, the tithes and the offerings, their grain, their, their animals, all of that, it recognized, God, you've blessed, and this is just simply a way for me to give back to you. Number nine, giving is a means by which we worship God. You know, it's easy for us uh, when we take the time to pass the offering plates to disengage from the service. And say, well, this isn't really a time of worship. This is a time of uh, obligation. This is a time when the church says, you know, you got to pass the silver plates because we're Baptists. And we got to pass these plates and, and try to collect enough money. And hopefully we get enough money for the, the week. And if we don't, we'll send them back through again. <laughs> Teasing. Uh, though there are some churches that have actually done that. That's an interesting thing. Uh, taken up a love offering and said, well, we didn't quite get enough. And they send it back. Uh, we will not do that under my leadership. Uh, but uh, not, a, not a good practice by any stretch of the imagination. But here's the point. Giving is a means by which we worship God. Don't disengage during an offering. Your heart ought to be continuing to worship. And this is just another avenue by which we worship God. But sometimes the offering is viewed as, well, this is the time I get to converse with everybody during the offering. We are disengaging in worship. I'm thankful that during the messages, uh, generally speaking, we're not conversing with each other. We shouldn't be doing it during the songs. We shouldn't be doing it during the, the offering. None of these things. This is the time for us to be able to worship God. And giving is a means by which we do so. Let's move on and continue to note some of the additional principles. Tithing not only must be prioritized, it requires and develops faith, must be motivated properly. Number five, or four rather, tithing helps keep a proper perspective on material possessions. How does it do so? Well, I think that it does so in a number of ways. Let me point out to you before we look at some of these that God never condemns a person merely on the basis of the amount of money that he possesses. In fact, Job, Abraham, Joseph of Arimathea, those are three examples of wealthy individuals in the word of God who use their wealth in a manner that was pleasing to God. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 teaches us that God has given us uh, richly all things to enjoy. Have you been blessed by God? Yes. Enjoy it. Now, don't selfishly use it and all that, but enjoy it. Rejoice in the fact of, of what God's done. And let me tell you, don't be the Christian that's the thunderstorm on everyone else's blessing. That must be nice. It is. <laughs> and I say that too. You ought to try it sometime. Oh man, I wish I got blessed like that. I wish you did too. But let me tell you how grand it is on my side of things. Okay? Don't be that person. Everything in life does not have to be negative. It is okay as a Christian to have shock of all shocks a good day. Let me tell you what else. It's okay as a Christian to have a day that is full of adversity, but you still rejoice and praise God for who he is and for what he's done. That's what God expects, and that is the mark of a mature Christian, one of the marks of a mature Christian. The one who is negative over everything has a perspective on life that is not properly valuing God's blessing. God's blessed us with health. Oh, well, yeah, but you don't understand. My finger hurts today. I'm sorry your finger hurts. But look at everything else that you have been blessed with. Guys, God has blessed us as individuals. And let me tell you, God has blessed this ministry. Lots of ways. The lives that this ministry has touched through the school. Did we take on some debt? Yes. Would I do it all over again the way God led in a heartbeat? Wish I still could, to be quite honest with you. Look at the lives that we've touched. Impacted lives for eternity. 
I had a student, former student, never would think I would ever receive this kind of text from him the other day. I was at work and he's texting me, hey, I'm talking to this person who's battling eternal security. Can you help me? Actually, the first text was, hey, is this still Mr. Q? <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, what do you want? Okay. I was shocked from this individual, one that I could have wrung his neck so many times. And here he is talking to a person about eternal security. We've been blessed. And it's easy for us to look around. Oh, I look at everything that's going wrong. Now we got a tree branch down. Now it's just in addition to everything else we got. Why wake up and why live if that's our mindset? Right? What's the point? I mean, if this is what we got to look forward to, great. <laughs> oh, there's probably going to be problems in heaven. Okay? I don't know. I hope some. <laughs> I wonder if some people aren't still going to complain how oh, the gold is shining in my eyes. Uh, I mean, I have no idea. I, it, I am amazed at what people find to complain about. And, and let's not be that person. Let's be very conscious and say, you know what? God, I'm going to praise you because of what you've done. And I'm going to praise you for who you are. God expects his children to enjoy the blessings that he's given us. And we are a blessed people. We are a blessed nation. Our poverty is many other nations' wealth. We've got so many things. If you don't believe me, take a look in your garage or in your attic <laughs> or in your closet. It's just amazing what we have. Let's not be disgruntled. But we also have to get, avoid being caught up in the pursuit of things. Paul explained in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that the love of money is the root of all evil. Again, it's not the possession of money, it's the desire for money. This person may or may not have money, that's irrelevant. But the desire for it, that will create a problem. We have to recognize that godliness with contentment is great gain. We have to realize the temporal nature of material possessions, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So those who are looking for um, more and are disgruntled, these people are seldom tithers. They want everything they can get. Tithing helps us keep a proper perspective on material possessions, and it does so by attracting our attention to several number of things. First, or several things. First of all, it reminds us of God's ownership. Whose does this belong to? God. Psalm chapter 24 and verse number one. Listen to it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. We looked at Psalm 50 in a message not rec or fairly recently. And it was there that we were reminded every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. A little later in verse 12. The world is mine and the fullness thereof. Who owns what you have? Not you. God does. He has given you these things. Everything belongs to him. You and I are simply stewards of that which belongs to God. And when we use that term, we're simply saying we are managers of another person's belongings, just as Joseph managed the belongings of Potiphar. You and I have been entrusted with certain things. And you might say, well, man, I sure wish I had a newer vehicle. Or I wish I had this, a newer home. Or I wish I had that home that has no problems. But God's entrusted you with the one he's entrusted you with. You manage it to the best of your ability. You do so in a way that is going to bring honor and glory to God. And you do so in a way that is going to first and foremost further his work and his kingdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. Trustworthy. Dependable. Do what you know to do. Well, I don't have this job where I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars annually. You take the job you've got and glorify the Lord. Well, God's not blessed me with this and, or God's leading me here. And, and sometimes we, we look at the direction that God's leading us. And, you know, sometimes it's an intimidating thing, isn't it? 
If we don't have an idea of how everything is going to work out, you take and you do the best of your ability. That's it. Let God finish that. But if you develop a lousy attitude in the midst of it, what have you hurt? You've hurt your testimony. You've hurt God's glory. There's the issue. It's not about you. It's about God. And as a steward of things that have been entrusted to God, I am reminded my responsibility is to simply be faithful. And tithing says, everything that I have belongs to God. My money, my time, my possessions, my talents, all of these things belong to God. I'm just simply giving him back what already, giving it back to him what already belongs to him. Tithing reminds us of God's ownership. Number two, tithing helps us avoid the danger of covetousness. Let's turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's a verse I've mentioned a couple of times. As you're doing so, let me mention uh, what Jesus instructed. Here is Jesus instructing his disciples in Luke chapter 12. And this is what he said. Take heed and beware of covetousness. And here was the observation. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. A while back we had the banners that asked, what define you? What is it that defines you? Are you defined by your possessions? Far too many Christians are. The essence of your life is not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. You are not identified by success. You're not identified by failure. You're not identified by things. You are to be identified by a faith that is without hypocrisy. A love that is pure and a love that is genuine, that's to characterize us. Here's Paul's instruction to Timothy. And he reminds this individual in regards, and the, the context has to do with uh, individuals who are um, looking at false, false teachers, really, coming along. Verse 5 speaks of supposing that uh, gain is godliness. What are they doing? They're equating godliness and gain as being the same. Uh, you need to be careful about that. Large churches equal God's blessing, not necessarily. Okay? A better paying job equals God's blessing, not necessarily. Okay? Sometimes Satan promises some of, this, some of these things too. And we need to be very careful that we're very discerning in these things. Well, it says in verse number six, godliness with contentment is great gain. Ungodliness with discontentment is great loss. Right? For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain <laughs> we can carry nothing out. Wow, Paul's a genius, right? And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Wow. I'd like food and raiment and a phone that works well. I'd like food and raiment and a computer that's up to date. I'd like food and raiment and how many vehicles and food and raiment and this and food and raiment and that. We need to be very careful. I understand the terms can be broad uh, and can include the basic necessities of life. And we can argue as to, in our culture, what are some of the necessities of life. Um, but let me tell you, our level of contentment we need to be very clear on this. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, verse we've referenced a number of times. Let your conversation, your life, be without covetousness. And just don't go down that path. Oh man, I sure wish I had it like they've got it. Uh, stop it. Well, I wish I had a new car. Well, stop that too. Man, that's a nice boat. Well, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you can covet boats. Uh, that, that is acceptable, but uh, I'm teasing. Uh, you look at, at, at some of these things, and, and uh, yeah, it's easy to look at the, you know, the big bass boat with a large front deck and say, you know, Jesus could have taught more effectively from a boat like this. I think it's God's will that I buy it. Uh, but you, you look at these things, it's all possessions. Be, let your Life, your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hmm. Well, I'd rather have a brand new boat or God. I'll take God. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. What a wonderful promise. Tithing helps avoid hoarding. James chapter number five. 
The condemnation comes to these individuals because they were wealthy, but they had unjustly acquired their wealth and they had selfishly hoarded their wealth. This is what James wrote. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. The rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were a fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last day. They had actually increased their level of judgment based on how they responded with the things they had been given. They could have distributed those clothing and, benef and, and benefited others. Instead, they hoarded it to the point where it was not only not beneficial to others, but it wasn't even beneficial to them. Their riches had rusted and corrupted. They could have simply given those and, and distributed, and it could have been used. My, how we sit on so much stuff that could be used to further God's work. Maybe it's an old pair of shoes. Maybe it's an old coat that you don't wear. Pray that God gives you an opportunity to hand it to someone. You see? But we'd rather sit on it. And they get tired of it eventually and throw it away. Let's be thinking about this. God gives us some opportunities. Number four, tithing, and I've mentioned that this morning, enables one to experience the joy of giving Acts chapter 20. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That's my goal behind this entire aspect, that you will go and take what we've gleaned and what we've studied and step out in faith and say, God, I want to see you work. I want to see you do some amazing things. And it might not be that he gives you thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. It might be that God gives you five to be a blessing to someone else. You see? It might be that God gives you the time to be a blessing to someone else. And it has nothing to do with money. God just simply opens up the opportunities. We get so tunnel vision so many times. Well, let me close by mentioning, fourthly, a reality expressed. What are we saying when it looks, we look at all of this? Number one, tithing, I believe, is God's method of supporting the local church. Offerings go beyond the 10% and are to be given as the Lord leads with a proper heart. I don't know the figures of what people give. My statements are not intended to negatively upset those who are tithing and contributing as they should. But at the same point in time, we have to be reminded there are certain facts and regarding the nature of ministry. Tithing, I believe, is God's method of supporting the local church. Number two, it takes, it takes money to effectively run any ministry. This is a reality, okay? When God's people stop tithing, what happens? God's work is hindered, okay? Now, this is just logic. I'm not saying that you have stopped tithing. I'm just saying this is what happens. When God's people remain faithful, God's work progresses. So let me tell you, remain faithful if you already are. If you're not tithing, yet you are earning an income, let me add to this, you are taking advantage of God's resources. It's a freeloader. Well, I don't like that. I'm sorry. It's what it is. If you are earning an income, if you're not earning an income, that's a whole other matter. Okay? But if you're earning an income and you're not tithing, you are taking advantage of God's resources. And so I would encourage you not to get mad, tithe. Do what the Lord's asked you to do. Well, what if we miss due to weather? Guess what? The power bill still keeps managing to come. Okay? Say, so, well, that's just, yeah, that's just pointless. I don't know. Maybe you make it up. Maybe you don't make it up. That's, you know that. I don't know that. I can see the summaries. Um, and and it's, a, it's a challenge. But we, the bills still come. And so we have still a responsibility. You know, the children of Israel were rebuked for living in luxury. The temple was in ruins. God's work has to be prioritized. Number three, remain faithful regardless of a perceived need. Uh, challenge, we've been praying extensively to be debt-free, and I think God's going to answer that prayer. But when he does, we cannot stop giving, thinking now we have a cushion on which we can rely. Well, look at the amount we got in savings. 
I can assure you, we will not, but I can assure you we could spend that amount in savings within a very short period of time. We will not do so. But we have to remain faithful. Prosperity cannot cause us to forget God, and it cannot cause us to fail to administer our responsibilities. Number five, four, remain confident that God will provide the needs for his ministry. And I want you to understand it is his ministry. The needs of Morgan and Baptist Church are in God's hands. You be faithful. And you know what? God will take care of it. Along with that, avoid discouragement and fear when things don't match up the way you think they should. Sometimes I wonder if the weekly offering summaries are not more of a problem than a blessing. Have you ever taken, I won't look, I'll close my eyes. No. Have you ever taken a, an offering weekly thing in the bulletin and think, oh my goodness, I know what I gave. Nobody else gives anything in this church. At that point in time, it's become a hindrance. It's discouragement. Oh man, we got, we got this many bills due this week. Trust me, Heather and I have had these conversations. You know what? God's been faithful to meet those bills every time. I don't know how many meetings I've sat in where we would wring our hands wondering how God's going to do it. He did it. Sometimes it wasn't the way we wanted it, but he did it. Sometimes it was an amazing way. He'll be, you be faithful. Avoid discouragement and avoid fear when things don't match up the way you think they should. Just be faithful. And number five, strive to earn eternal rewards. Don't be content with temporal rewards. Strive for the eternal. What are we doing? We are attempting to take God's message to the people of this area. Expand God's kingdom, God's work. Yes, it takes money to do so, but this is what we're trying to do. We're not trying to come up with the best looking buildings in Burke County. It's a good thing because we lost that contest a long time ago. <laughs> All right. We got plenty of challenges. There is no doubt about that. But that's not why we're here. Doesn't mean we don't want to take care of them. Doesn't mean we don't want to invest back into them. But we're here to minister to people. Let's be faithful. And let's earn the eternal rewards. And I think you'll be amazed to see how God leads. <laughs>